Welcome, everybody. I'm Simon Rosenberg of NDN and, uh, and the New Policy Institute. It's a great pleasure today uh, to be hosting a, a major public policy speech about an issue that many people care a great deal about, uh, which is how the internet and our telecommunications ecosystem is going to evolve over uh, in the years ahead. Uh, clearly, this is an issue that has been debated hotly, uh, I think, since Washington itself virtually was. <laughs> created a long time ago. This is not a new issue in this town, but I think there's new impetus to have this conversation, uh, in part, not only because of the court cases that are moving their way through the system, but because of the very far-reaching and ambitious broadband plan announced by Julius Janikowski and the FCC uh, just recently, which really is an important intellectual contribution to how this could all happen over the next 10 years. And what's exciting is that this issue of how we maximize the extraordinary potential of this uh, telecommunications revolution that's happening here and around the world uh, is really going to be one of the great public policy challenges of our time. The reason being is that the upside of what we're seeing develop is so extraordinary. I mean, we will be at a point, at some point in the next 10 years, where essentially everyone in the world will be connected as never before. We'll hit some tipping point where we will be at 90, 95 percent penetration of mobile devices uh, in the world, and that, you know, if you go back in European history, it was the democratization of information through the printing press that really was the precursor to the Enlightenment and the Renaissance. And I think that we're on the verge of seeing a, a really important point in all of human history where there will be an unprecedented wave of democratization of information where you can imagine a farmer in Chiapas making $2 a day having essentially the same access to information as my son at my house who's got a 24-inch iMac, right? This, the idea, the possibility of this, the understanding of what becomes then possible for, for humanity as this enormous global event emerges is something that I and I think this organization look at with great enthusiasm and excitement. And I think the obligation then from policymakers is to do everything we possibly can to ensure that as much of this potential is realized and that we minimize as much of the downside that may come in all of this, but also to allow the market and everyday people to work together to create, uh, to realize this extraordinary moment in human history. And so it's, uh, and, and this debate that we're having here in the U.S. is obviously going to be playing out in every civil society around the world. How do they find that magic balance between what private corporations need to do and what is in the common good, and how do you find the balance between uh, openness and privacy and security and, and commerce and all the things that we're going to have to negotiate. I mean, even in my school that my kids go to, in the public school here in Northwest D.C., because I wrote a paper a few years ago calling for America to put a laptop in every backpack for every school child, I've been brought in by our principal to think through how to digitize, you know, a school, a public school. And what's interesting to me is that there really isn't any kind of real model for this yet. There really isn't an understanding of what age, what tools the teachers have. Uh, and in a generation where these kids are expert in things like we when they're six years old, right, it is urgent that we solve this issue, just this one narrow piece of this, right, which is how we're going to bring this extraordinary technology, the knowledge that comes about through access to the Internet into our schools. Because if countries like Libya and Uruguay can have a national commitment to give every kid in their countries access to, the, to a, a laptop computer to bring them into the digital world, why can't we here in the United States? So I, th I think that the basket of issues that we're going to be talking about today are of enormous import. It really is the foundation of the 21st century global economy. Getting it right is going to be critical. And so we're excited to be hosting an important speech towards that goal today. Our guest is somebody who is well known to many of you. Tom Talkey is the Executive Vice President, Public Affairs, Policy, and Communications at Verizon, a small little company here in the United States. In his role, uh, Tom oversees media relations, employee communications, reputation management. That's a fun one. Right? <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Uh, philanthropy, corporate responsibility, and external relations for Verizon. As the company's senior policy executive, he's responsible for the development of Verizon's public policy positions and advocacy at the local, state, and, uh, local, state, federal, and international levels. He serves as a member of Verizon's leadership council, and previously, as many of you know, Tom was a member of Congress representing Iowa's 2nd Congressional District. And as somebody who had his, worked in his first political campaign in Iowa back in the 1980s, Iowa still holds a very special place in my heart. Uh, and 
that he was a, a member of the United States House of Representatives uh, for how many years, Tom? Twelve. Twelve years. And before that, served in the Iowa General Assembly. So please join me in welcoming. And I will say that as there are about 70, 80 people in the room. We have several hundred people online watching live, <coughs> as it should be, by the way, for this speech. So welcome, Tom. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Simon. You have provided such insight and shown so much leadership in this area. It really is a pleasure to uh, uh, be here with you. Uh, thank you for hosting us. I guess I'll get my glasses <laughs> so I can. In San Jose, in the heart of the high-tech world, uh, sits what's known as the Winchester Mystery House. It started out in the late 1880s as a small farmhouse, and by the 1920s was transformed into a 160-room, seven-story Victorian mansion with doors and stairways that lead nowhere. The house grew that way with no logic or plan because the owner just kept adding and adjusting and adding again as needs or desires required. The result is an architectural white elephant. In the world of communications policy, we have our own version of the mystery house. It started as the Radio Act of 1929, was subsumed by the Communications Act of 1934, and after numerous amendments during the last uh, three quarters of a century, it's become an interesting maze that the Federal Communications Commission and all of us have together have to navigate as we play various roles in the internet ecosystem. It's time we turned our attention to this mystery house and figured out how it can, can be remodeled to meet the needs of a new era. This task is all the more important because thanks to the efforts of the Federal Communications Commission, we now have a national broadband plan. That plan lays out a vision for a vibrant broadband and internet marketplace. Now is the time to focus on updating the law affecting the internet. In my view, the current statute is badly out of date. To fulfill the uh, potential of broadband, it's time for Congress to take a fresh look at our nation's telecommunications policy framework. Verizon's efforts over the last year or two to find common ground with Google and others on the issues of net neutrality, behavioral advertising, and privacy protection, and other internet policies really brought home to me the dilemma that we face. Too often, these important discussions on policy for the internet degenerated into disputes over the statutory authority of the FCC. Then with the Comcast BitTorrent case, it became clear that the debate over jurisdiction wasn't just an intellectual exercise. The authority of the FCC to regulate broadband providers under the so-called Information Services Title, or Title I of the Communications Act, was at best murky. One idea recently floated to solidify the FCC's jurisdiction was to place broadband under the old rules that applied to telephone networks under Title II. To us, this clearly was outside the scope of the statute. It also highlighted the danger of attempting to, attempting to apply statutory provisions intended for the telephone industry of the 1990s, 1900s, to the communication and internet world of the 21st century. In confronting this hard question about jurisdictional authority, we also faced this policy question. If Title I and Title II don't apply to the internet space, as we sometimes contended, what are we saying about the authority of government overall in this space? As our efforts to find common ground on the key issues became more difficult because of the disputes over agency jurisdiction, it has become clear to me that we needed a fresh look at what the role of government should be in the internet ecosystem, and specifically at the statute governing the telecommunications industry. We've spent some time thinking about that, and today I'd like to share our perspectives. 
first, let's talk a minute about what's working in the internet ecosystem. And then I'll offer some suggestions for a fresh start at developing a workable internet policy. Back in, the 19, in 1999, FCC Chairman Bill Kennard said America would get broadband, quote, by letting a competitive marketplace thrive. And I continue quoting, we need, need an intentional restraint born of humility that, that we can't predict where this market is going. In a marketing, market developing at these speeds, the FCC must follow a piece of advice as old as Western civilization itself. First, do no harm. Call it a high-tech Hippocratic oath, he said. So with competition and deregulation as our touchstones, the FCC has taken a hands-off deregulatory approach to the broadband market. That was Kennard's statement of the nation's internet policy. There is no doubt that the policy framework put in place by the Clinton administration and continued by the Bush administration has jump-started innovation and the spread of broadband has worked. Broadband providers have invested hundreds of billions of dollars for deployment of broadband networks. It's a huge investment program. Verizon alone has deployed more fiber in the US than all of the countries in Europe combined. The result? Today, about 96% of Americans have access to at least two providers of wireline broadband and as many as three wireless providers, and more than 55 million Americans can connect to a broadband network capable of delivering at least 50 megabits per second of downstream speed. It's not an accident that over the past decade, the internet ecosystem has become an official global economic engine, a critical global economic engine, or that so much of the innovation from the core to the edge is based here in the United States. It isn't only companies like Amazon and Google and eBay that have been spawned here in the US. We have companies like Salesforce.com, innovating around cloud computing, and Medtronix, pioneering medical implants and transmits vital signs over the web to physicians. Now, across the ecosystem, we have a whole new thing happening. Many players are crossing their traditional lines of business to offer consumers the products and services they want. The marketplace is increasingly characterized by collaboration and partnerships among various companies. So Google and Motorola and Verizon get together to create the droid to compete against Apple and AT&T. The collaborating partners are ever-changing, creating a new dynamic of what some have called modular competition. So the approach Bill Kennard talked about a few years ago of using a light regulatory hand to create a highly competitive marketplace has worked. Now we need to put in place a framework that will continue to encourage ongoing investment and innovation for this vibrant ecosystem. And this should be the cornerstone for a refreshed policy framework. So given all this seemingly good news, what's the problem? The problem is, is that the underlying statute by which we're governed is irrelevant to the ecosystem that has developed. The internet today hosts a quarter of the world's populations close to two billion users. The Verizon network alone connects 100 million of these users with over 1.7 billion text messages and 50 million video pictures exchanged. 400 million emails received, 8.7 terabytes of, uh, of video streamed every day. These are, these are new pressures and challenges and problems cropping up that policymakers didn't consider a decade ago such as the five billion potential cyber threats monitored and acted upon each day. The issues that arise from all these new players and cross-platform competitors don't fit nicely within the boundaries of traditional communications regulation. The instinct is to impose regulation, but it's a balancing act. We want order, but we also don't want to hinder investment and innovation in this dynamic broadband an internet marketplace. So how do we accomplish this? I certainly don't have all the answers for exactly what a 
21st century policy framework would look like. But if I may, I would like to suggest four general principles that constitute the foundation on which such a framework should be built. First, consumers must be fully empowered. Any new policy should put the users in charge. Consumers should have the ability to choose the devices and the software they want, access whatever lawful content and applications they need, and obtain the products and services that they seek both on the move and at home. Empowered consumers mean well-informed consumers, consumers who are able to make choices and decisions based on easily understood language and transparent business practices. Providing consumers with more easily understood and relevant information about their broadband connections, will, how their broadband connections will perform, for example, or how their applications may affect their broadband experience, or what consumers' privacy expectations should be when they download content, helps promote competition and innovation. Second, the consumer must feel safe. If we want consumers to use broadband, and I suspect everyone in this room does, and if we want them to use it in all the ways that we envision, social networking, online shopping and banking, online medical records and remote medical monitoring, online education, cloud storage of such personal content as family photos, then consumers must be confident that their online security and privacy are protected. These policies should be consumer friendly and uniform across the ecosystem. For example, a behavioral advertising policy that requires an easy to use process for affirmative consent from a user before their, that user can be tracked online should apply to all players engaged in behavioral advertising, regardless of where they sit in the space and what technology is used. Third, Consumer access and adoption should be priorities. In order to ensure that new broadband technologies are fully deployed everywhere, we must tackle one of the most vexing issues from the old uh, communications world, the subsidy issue. Over the years, there has been a great deal of talk on Capitol Hill and the FCC about addressing subsidies like universal service, and for good reason. The National Broadband Plan's recommendations for addressing facilities-based deployment in high-cost areas is headed in the right direction. But we need a new approach to addressing the challenge of giving low-income Americans access to the Internet. When you look at how we've done this in other consumer-assisted programs, let's say for food and, or fuel, you don't see the energy companies or the food companies collecting money from their customers and then figuring out how to split it up among the uh, among themselves. Instead, the consumer receives direct support from the government and then uses that support to purchase fuel or to purchase groceries. We should look at that model for fuel assistance and food stamps when it comes to internet access. Competitive subsidies, or I should say competitive subsidies that are technologically neutral and targeted solely for the benefit of consumers, not corporate intermediaries would be one alternative that would help uh, ensure the national broadband deployment reaches all Americans. Fourth, government's role should be to protect consumers and ensure a properly functioning free market. Government's role should be to protect consumers and ensure a properly functioning free market. Put another way, the test for government intervention in the marketplace is to prevent either harm to users or anti-competitive activity. Today, there are a host of consumer protection concerns from online fraud, child protection, privacy that need to be addressed. That's one bucket of issues, and I won't focus on that today. The other set of issues focuses on ensuring the proper functioning of the free market. And let me offer some thoughts on this issue. Government has a legitimate interest in ensuring a functioning marketplace, and all the players in the space, especially the good act actors, should want government to play that role. 
that needs to provide incentives for investment and innovation and provide choice. It's the free market being free for competition. So the government has a role to play in assuring that no player in the internet ecosystem is constraining competition or abusing market power, whether it's a network provider, a software company, or anyone else in the internet value chain. In fact, these distinctions themselves are becoming less and less germane with every passing day as everyone in the marketplace plays in everyone else's sandbox. Computer companies sell phones, and quite successfully. Search engines sell operating systems. Network providers create their own app stores, and so it goes. That means that the value proposition to the consumer is really a package created by many companies acting together with little, if any, regard to their previous corporate histories. So no set of companies should be immune from scrutiny. Think about the evolution of cloud computing. It is the cloud that will allow consumers to have access to their content wherever they are, regardless of the device. But who controls the cloud and the information in it? If it's anyone, it's not likely to be a network provider, although it could be. It's much more likely to be some entity that came to control access to the data or the software. For example, consider the messages sent by users on a social network. They are the functional equivalent of an email, but the functionality and therefore the potential control is in the cloud. If we worry about the movement of email and other content among networks, then we need to worry just as much about their movement and treatment in the middle, not at the edge of the network. The bottom line is this. Harm to consumers and competition should not be permitted from any source. So the level playing field needs to be big enough to include all of the players. If you're on the field, then the referee can blow the whistle. That's, that's a simple principle, and it's a good one. Good public policy is always good for companies that want to play by the rules. Now let's spend a moment on process. Traditional regulatory models based on rules written to shape and control more static one-purpose industries such as TV, broadcasting, or telephone service are not only out of step with today's dynamic converged internet ecosystem, they are harmful to the innovation process that characterizes broadband in the internet. Traditional agency fact-finding, often through notices or public requests for comment, are usually geared towards specific rules or regulatory outcomes. Instead, we could structure a process that uses the innovative, flexible, and technology-driven nature of the internet to address issues as they arise. Instead of the traditional rulemaking process, federal enforcement agencies could structure themselves around an ongoing engagement with internet engineers and technologists to analyze technology trains, uh, trends, to find norms to guide such questions as network management, and understand in advance the implication of new emerging technologies. Technology uh, leaders and experts from all players involved in the internet should set up voluntary organizations and forums to provide advice, recommendations, and advisory opinions to government agencies. This will help inform the agency's role as backstops and deter damaging activities that undermine the vibrant competition and openness that defines the internet. In pursuing bad actors, the government should use understandable principles that can provide guidance that are informed by experience. Some will suggest that more detailed rules are needed, but by adopting the approach I've outlined, we can both protect consumers and competition and ensure the flexible, adaptive oversight that fits the innovation, innovative nature of the internet that we all want to preserve. All of this will require clear statutory authority for the implementing enforcement agency. That, defining that jurisdiction, is a job for the Congress. Earlier I referenced the quote from Bill Kennard in which he spoke of the role humility played in setting policy. I offer these observations today in the same spirit. In putting forward this policy framework, Verizon hardly views it as the capstone to a discussion, but rather the beginning. 
We don't have all the answers. We want to work with all of you to ensure a vibrant internet ecosystem and fulfill the vision for the technology and the networks laid out in the National Broadband Plan. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to take any questions or listen to any comments that anybody might have. And I also, just let me add that anyone who's online, if you follow the directions on your screen, you can uh, submit questions which we'll be able to read in the room as well. So Jake, we have a mic. Please raise your hand and remember that you'll be on YouTube forever and ever. Uh, <laughs> the question, question today. Who would like to start in the room? Anybody? Tom, thank you, by the way. Yes, please. Wait, hold, hold on. Oh, say yes, please, please. Mm. Hi, Lynn Stanton, TR Daily. Sure. I'm just trying to envision exactly how this would work. Are, are you picturing something that would become like a development of, of common law or like IRS interpretation where companies would look at previous rulings on things that were okay and things that were not and try and guess how what they want to do fits in or? I, I envision a world in which uh, the agency designated by Congress or the agencies designated by Congress spell out some principles that they're going to follow. Uh, that as issues arise, if they are not resolved through a gov an inter uh, uh, industry self-governance process, they would move to the agency, and the agency would make a decision based on the facts at hand. And so in the course of that, you would be getting the evolution of the law or the rules of the game for the Internet space. Uh, the advantage of this is that it allows for flexibility. It allows the agency to be informed by uh, ever-changing mores and standards within the industry, changing technology and marketplace, uh, and uh, it also has the advantage of rendering quick answers or giving quick answers uh, to the uh, questions that are posed. So I think that this is a mechanism that can work well. It is a uh, mechanism that uh, has been used by some agencies, like the Federal Trade Commission in certain areas, and uh, it is a, a one that I believe is much better suited to the uh, internet uh, ecosystem than a process whereby you uh, set out rules trying to anticipate what's going to happen in the marketplace four or five, six years from now. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, Todd Shields, Bloomberg News. So uh, is the problem with Title II that it just won't work or that you don't like it and you want Congress to step in and prevent the FCC from imposing <laughs> that on you? Well, there are several problems with Title II, but let me limit it to, to two things. Uh, the first is, is that I believe, as an attorney, while I don't practice law, I, I do have, uh, I am an attorney and I've spent, I spent some time in the Congress, and I think it's fairly clear that the FCC doesn't have the statutory authority under Title II to regulate broadband or uh, the internet space. Uh, second, so that's problem one. And this is a problem that really needs to be addressed by the Congress. I mean, just, just from a very basic perspective, this is a big part of the economy now. It's a growing space. The Congress hasn't addressed how it ought to be governed. And uh, somewhere along the line, Congress has to step up to the, uh, its responsibility and address the issue. And I, that's the first point. The second uh, point that I'd say is, is that Title II was written for a very different industry. Uh, and trying to you know, kind of fit what we're doing today into a structure that was intended for uh, the 19, uh, 1900s industry just doesn't make any sense in my mind. And the, and the implications and repercussions uh, are very significant. So I think that, that trying to force Force, uh, this, uh, force the industry into the Title II structure would be very damaging to the uh, innovation and investment that we want. Hi, Kathy Sloan, CCIA. I'm not a reporter. <laughs> uh, sounds like you're out of the telecommunications business now that everything is digital as opposed to analog. You mentioned Bill Kennard when he was chairman of the FCC. In fact, there were hundreds of ISPs. Um, and in fact, Bell Atlantic, the precursor of Verizon, was one of the companies that lobbied most heavily for the 96 Telecom Act. Um, 
now that everything's bundled together by AT&T and Verizon and the major cable ops, is that what makes it a whole new world? Or, I mean, it seemed, you, you mentioned the partnerships, but the partnerships seem to always need to include Verizon or AT&T or a cable operator to succeed. I guess, uh, uh, first, uh, the, um, when I look at the uh, world that we are dealing with today, uh, there are several things that have changed. We've moved from analog to digital. We have much more control in the hands of the consumers. The consumers shape their experience much more than they were able to before. Uh, we have many players offering an array of services. So you have lots of players who are able to use apps to provide, for example, calling services. Uh, so the uh, behavioral advertising, it can be done by many of the players in the space. So I think that there are an array of issues that spread across the space. Privacy was one example that I gave. And from a consumer's perspective, having one set of privacy rules for one group in the space and another set of rules for another group in the space really confuses the consumer. If you look at this from a consumer perspective, they should be able to know what the rules are and know when they're giving permission that it applies to track them, for example, that it applies across the space. Or if they deny someone the ability to track, that should apply to all the players in the space. So that's, I guess, first observation. The second observation is, is that uh, there are a lot of different uh, groupings of players, but they all don't involve Verizon and, uh, and, uh, uh, or AT&T. They involve Comcast, they involve Sprint, as one was announced yesterday. Uh, they involve uh, T-Mobile, uh, which is announcing its own uh, programs. As we move to a world of 4G, we're going to have more and more players moving to the wireless space, which I'm sure uh, you and others at CPIA are uh, excited about. This is where we see now great growth in the uh, access to the internet. And uh, so I think that we are going to continue to see this, these groupings of companies that keep ever changing, competing with one another to provide new services and products in the internet space. The, when I, and when it comes to cloud computing, I think you gotta, the, the power is shifting into the cloud. When I, as a consumer, start putting my pictures in the cloud, I have my, uh, all of my personal information in the cloud, I am relying on the ability of people to pull information down from the cloud in order to provide services to me. The player who controls the information in the cloud and has the consumer connection is the player that is gonna be the dominant uh, participant in the marketplace, in my view. And so I think this is a rapidly changing world particularly as we move to the cloud computing, which will be the heart of the internet experience. And if I can just add one thing for those watching online, if you want to tweet in a question, uh, we're MBN729. Apparently, Twitter is uh, all a flitter with this uh, talk, Tom. So, oh, I know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, Jake, who else are we? Yes, over here. Hi, um, Adam Bender with Communications Daily. Yeah. Um, have you uh, floated this idea with any members of Congress? And uh, how long do you think this would take to put into place given the current political environment and the elections coming up in November? Uh, first, uh, you know, we've had conversations with members of Congress from time to time, and I think I alluded to in my comments that uh, for the last uh, several years we've been talking to, uh, among ourselves and to other players in the industry and to consumer groups and to uh, members of Congress about the need to uh, address some of these uh, questions. Uh, but I, in my own mind, and I'll just speak for myself, in my own mind this has taken on a uh, a new sense of urgency, so to speak, because of the experiences we've had trying to find some common ground on issues like net neutrality, uh, because of the attempt to work with across the industry to find some rules for behavioral advertising that could uh, be consumer friendly, and uh, because of, uh, of the uh, court case that's pending with uh, Comcast uh, BitTorrent. So all of those things have uh, raised, keep raising this jurisdictional question. And if you've got that question, it seems to me you've got to look to the uh, policymakers, and, the, and that's Capitol Hill. Now, how long does it take? Um, your guess is as good as mine. Uh, 
uh, Congress wasn't designed to move quickly, and it rarely does. <laughs> uh, so I think what I, I think that it's fair to say that if the court in the Comcast to BitTorrent case should reach the conclusion that the FCC doesn't have jurisdiction under Title I to do what it did in that particular case, if they would decide the case on that basis, that certainly would cause Congress to move more quickly. And I'd like Congress to be thinking in you know, some broader terms if they do act. Uh, but usually, I think it's a fair bet to say at this stage of the uh, uh, congressional uh, session uh, that in this Congress, I think it would be really unlikely that the current Congress would act. So I think this would be something for Congress, uh, the next Congress, or the one following. But you've got to get the discussion moving. Yes, sir. No, I'm sorry. Okay, do this, and then we'll go. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll let you do yeah, let me taking. Do I'm sorry. I'm yeah, it's okay. Uh, my name is Tom Seitz. I'm with uh, Height Analytics. I think the FCC has specifically said that, you know, if they were to lose in Title I, they will attempt to use Title II to govern the Internet. Where does that, what happens then? Is it, are we back to the courts right away, do you think? Or how do you think the process, can you, I guess, um, opine on what you think the process <laughs> is if, if the court rules that the FCC doesn't have jurisdiction under Title I? Well, uh, first, uh, we don't know what the court decision will be. I do think it's fair to say that Chairman Janikowski has been assigned by this administration the responsibility to address these issues. So he's got a real challenge if the court pulls the Title I option out from under him. And uh, I believe Title II will be equally problematic, more problematic, frankly, from a legal perspective but certainly from a policy perspective, it creates a whole new set of issues. So uh, I would be a little bit surprised if the FCC would try to move in that direction. I recognize the issue has been raised, but there are so many implications that I would be surprised if the FCC moved in that direction. If they did, I can assure you it would end up in court. Uh, bottom line here is, is that, as I keep saying, you know, there is an entity that's supposed to address these questions. It is the Congress, and uh, the Congress really needs to just uh, create uh, a governance framework, a, amend, a change of the statute in order to reflect the changing world. Okay, do you have something else? Mm. Shikana Katabana with Forty Swimex Group Consulting. Um, I just want to change a little bit and ask you what your thoughts are, especially as we talk about innovation and don't you think maybe that we also are supposed to be talking about spectrum access and the availability of spectrum at the same time? Oh, there are a whole lot of issues that I haven't talked on this, or discussed this morning. Uh, I think, for example, in the National Broadband Plan, the uh, steps that the FCC has taken to address the spectrum issue and future spectrum needs is terrific. I mean, this, is a, uh, this is a key element to the prospering of uh, uh, the mobile broadband uh, uh, business in the years ahead, uh, it is what's going to make it possible for consumers to have, you know, live video and medical monitoring and machine-to-machine -machine activities that will improve the environment and uh, allow us to our commutes to be easier. And uh, I mean, there are so many possibilities that are opened by mobile broadband. And to uh, to make that to realize those opportunities, you have to have spectrum. So the spectrum uh, steps, or the steps that are suggested in the National Broadband Plan to free up some spectrum, that's really important and the uh, FCC should be applauded. This is a tough set of issues. It takes a while to get this done, but getting the ball rolling before the crisis hits is really important. And uh, so yes, that's uh, one of those issues that needs to be addressed. And, and you know, stepping back a little bit, a lot of issues are, re are in a sense, resolve themselves if you get a lot more capacity out there. Uh, but there are still governance issues that have to be confronted when you have many players in a space and they all have the authority to do wonderful things but also to misbehave. And if they have the capability to misbehave, somebody's got to be there as a policeman. My sense is, is that no one is suggesting that the Internet space uh, should be the wild, wild west. We ought to have a rule of law for the internet space. 
And uh, now our question is, what is that rule of law? Congress, it seems to me, should determine that. Who has the authority to enforce that rule of law? Again, Congress should determine that. And what is the process to be used? I think that getting the right principles in place and the right process can make this, uh, can, can create an environment that will really allow this space to uh, fulfill its promise. Let's maybe take two more in the room if there are any additional questions. Anybody else? Well, let me, let me, Kathy, let me see if we got one other. Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, it's Garland McCoy with Technology Policy Institute. I was just wondering, Tom, if you'd looked at the DACA bill, the Digital Age Communications Act that uh, Senator DeMint introduced as sort of a framework that looks more at the an a, antitrust model to look at, at uh, uh, again, the enforcement of bad actors. And, of course, that some of the problems that were voiced as well as it takes too long for the antitrust process to work its way and, and some sort of... Uh, you know, there's some discussion about having a number of the stakeholders, both uh, carriers, middleware, uh, consumers, uh, to, you know, have a very walled off, protected group with some engineers in there that could make a, a quick call and say, okay, well, this, this truly is a bad actor. This particular company is truly using perceived market power to, you know, harm consumers. Or, no, this is just a technological glitch. I mean, we, we, we hear this complaint come in from this particular company, Amazon, and they think something nefarious is going on here. Turns out it's just a technology glitch. They're loading up some software, something happens, there's a drop in, in speed or whatever. So that you quickly get, you know, the first round of, yes, this is a, a, a real market problem here. We have a bad actor we have to deal with, and we can sort of maybe you know, fast track and a trust. Or no, this is really, you know, this isn't any, you know, God or some other force is is is, is fault here, software, whatever. I was just wondering if you'd looked at that as a model. I've looked at that proposal. There have been others that have been floated around by think tanks and, uh, you know, this has frankly been going on for about a decade. I think that we've had some of these things uh, addressed. Uh, uh, you know, back in the uh, in the Canard days at the FCC, there was a lot of work done on reforming that entire agency uh, to make it more relevant to the uh, to the current uh, environment and the current world we live in. So I, I think that a lot of good work has been done here. Uh, what where I what I do think uh, is needed, however, is for Congress to address the issue. Uh, now is the time; they can't keep putting it off. I guess the uh, second observation that I'd make is, is that it is, um, I think, important for consumers and for companies to believe they can get a quick answer if an issue arises. And uh, so um, processes that are going to last a long time probably aren't going to fill the bill because in this very fast-moving space, people want a quick response. Tom, let me, let me yeah. end with <coughs> a question from cloud, uh, as, as would be a <coughs> appropriate just to, to close, which is, um, this is from a, somebody named Jamming Econo, and uh, Talkie, uh, Mr. Talkie keeps talking about an agency, not the FCC. Is he suggesting that the Communications Act is outmoded and uh, future regulation should move out of the FCC, broadband regulation should move out of the FCC? I'm not suggesting that broadband uh, uh, regulation should move out of the FCC, nor am I suggesting that it should be within the FCC. I really want to remain a little agnostic about that. Let's just be frank. If I stood up here and said the FCC is our favorite agency, a lot of players would say, well, of course, you guys have the inside track at the FCC because you've been working with them all the time. Uh, the, uh, some would prefer to have it at the Federal Trade Commission. And there are some companies in the space that say, we're before the Federal Trade Commission, we shouldn't have to be before the FCC. I guess the bottom line is, is that I don't think the agency at this juncture is important. What's important is, what is the policy? What is the process for enforcing that policy? And can we get it in place uh, promptly so that, that there is a rule of law that governs the space? That's what I think is important. 
And I think Congress can determine whether it's a somewhat reformed FCC or whether it's the FTC or some new entity. That's a role that Congress can play. Now, as this discussion evolves, you know, I may have a clearer view. <laughs> uh, but right now, I, d I don't think that's the uh, most important question. First, you have to make the decision that it's time to move. Any final thoughts before we go? No, I don't think so. I thank you. I thank you very much sure. for uh, giving us uh, this opportunity to address the issue. And I uh, uh, encourage people to start you know, engaging in a discussion. Uh, these policies, uh, the policy development process takes a while in our system. And so you've got to move that uh, process along with a lot of input. And so I think we should uh, encourage that as much as possible in your organization and you personally yeah. do a great job uh, in that area. Thank you. Thank you. Where can they find the speech, by the way? Where can uh, we? The, the, speech, the speech will be on our policy blog. Uh, it will also be in other places, I'm sure. But in addition, uh, we will uh, be putting up a policy memorandum, I'll say, that goes into substantially more detail beyond the uh, remarks <coughs> I made this morning. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks very much.